Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Rob. Uh, both of them did a great job setting the table for what I'm going to talk about today, which is my report called The Unraveling, uh, How Poorly Crafted Education Policies Are Failing North Carolina's Sorry. Children. And I'm going to try to move through this pretty quickly because I want to make sure to save some time at the end here uh, it's warming up, to it. answer some questions for you. Um, Just be as this warms up here, <laughs> go ahead and uh, move to the first slide. Now, as Rob mentioned, I used prior to starting work with the North Carolina Justice Center, um, I spent nearly 10 years working at the General Assembly on their nonpartisan fiscal research staff. And when I started there in 2006, um, you know, North Carolina had a strong reputation for having uh, bipartisan, progressive education policy, really sort of the shining star of the South. And if you think back through North Carolina's history, you know, we had the first public university, North UNC. Um, back in the um, back in the Depression, we had the School Machinery Act. North Carolina was one of the first states to actually accept responsibility from the counties for funding public schools. Um, we actually had a lot of great progress on school integration for a southern state. Um, we had consolidation of city districts to the county level. Um, we had in our big cities like Mecklenburg and um, Wake County, we had school integration efforts that were very successful. Um, Governor Hunt and Smart Start, strong support for national board certification for teachers, building a homegrown teacher force via the teaching fellows, which unfortunately went away. Um, we were a leader in high quality pre-K programs via more four, and we also had award-winning dual credit programs aimed at first-time college goers with Learn and Earn. Um, now these were not just feel-good uh, efforts, they actually had a positive impact on students. Uh, you often hear about these tests that are international um, comparisons, and a lot of times they focus on the negative headlines. Well, in 2011, um, North Carolina had a big enough sample size in the TIMS test that North Carolina sort of participated as its own country, and the results were great for North Carolina. Um, we were one of nine states participating in the country, and only five education systems outperformed North Carolina in grade four math. It was Singapore, Hong Kong, South Korea, Taiwan, and Japan. Um, in eighth grade math, it was those same five countries, and Massachusetts outperformed North Carolina. Um, in science, we were in line with the national average. Um, then there's also the 2012 Harvard study on international growth trends. Uh, it ranked North Carolina 12th in terms of student growth from 1992 to 2011. And it singled out North Carolina as one of the top six states for sort of bang for the buck. Uh, you know, we've never spent a ton on education in the state, but over that period through the 90s and early 2000s, um, we did get very good results for our spending. Um, after that, of course, things changed in North Carolina. And uh, so this is more what we picture when we think about education policy in North Carolina these days. You know, rather than having new programs uh, vaulting student performance in the state, you know, we, we think about divisive programs that, and protests and failing national rankings. So I wanted to think about how we got to this place. Um, and there were really two sort of main drivers that I saw when I started thinking about. And the first is policy agenda gr grounded in ideology rather than evidence. And this is sort of the most uh, obvious thing, you know, that most of you have probably noticed as well, you know, that, we're, we're getting a lot of policies that are not based on evidence, um, and we're avoiding things we know work, such as pre-K, uh, investing in teacher assistance, adequate supplies, professional development, supports for new <laughs> beginning teachers, high quality textbooks, school facilities, child nutrition, after school programs. All these things that we know boost student performance we haven't been investing in. We've been investing in a lot of other things um, without much evidence. Of course, you don't always have to have a strong evidence, evidentiary background in order to do a new program. Um, you know, sometimes that's how you have innovation is to do new things. Um, but many of these programs uh, have been tried elsewhere and failed. And so then the second thing I, I noticed when I looked back over the last seven years was that how poor governance has given us not just programs that I don't think work or meet any sort of evidentiary basis, but we've really gotten the worst possible versions of these programs. You know, this started last summer, I was writing about education savings accounts, a program that we got from another state, yet a program that when you look at the policy, 
is uh, much weaker than the education savings accounts in other states, and we'll, we'll get to that. So that, that's really um, what drove this report. And I really wanted to highlight how poor governance had played a role, and that's really how I hope this report contributes to the, con the um, conversation around education policy in the state. So wrote the report, The Unraveling, and I um, want to start by pointing out what those sort of poor governance practices are. Uh, the first one I identify is folding programs into omnibus budget bills. Um, there are sort of three, there are basically three reasons why this folding a program into a budget bill is problematic. First is that it limits debate. Uh, when you have a program that's run as a standalone bill, uh, that program has to be heard in committee. Generally, committees are, um, are, are comprised of General Assembly members with some subject area expertise. They'll, they'll debate the bill. They can offer amendments to improve the bill. Uh, they can bring in outside experts, have public comment. And it's really the chance to engage stakeholders to take a policy idea and strengthen that idea. Um, you know, it doesn't always have to be yes or no. It can be used as a um, process for actually strengthening your policy ideas. Uh, the second issue with folding a program into the omnibus budget bill is that standalone bills require majority support while a... Um, Omnibus budget bills are a good way to get controversial programs sort of sneak, snuck through the process. Um, members of the General Assembly have, are under immense pressure to actually vote for the budget bills of their party. So when you have a controversial program that's part of that budget bill, it's more likely to get approval even if it would be unable to get a pr majority approval standing alone on its own. So you end up getting a lot more controversial, divisive uh, programs sort of passed through that way. And then the third thing, something Senator Chaudhry uh, alluded to, is that Senator, Sen uh, sorry, budget bills are very large. Um, so, and they're often given to members with very little time to review. I think when the Senate had to vote on the budget bill this year, they were given less than 24 hours to review a document about this thick. And um, so a lot of things can change before members can see it, and um, there's not a lot of chance to look at the the details of how things are going to work. Uh, second thing I noticed is the abandonment of oversight and learning. Um, there are sort of two committees that the General Assembly often uses to publicly educate themselves and to observe what's going on in education policy in North Carolina. First is education oversight. Um, the education oversight committee has been around since 1990. And uh, they meet to hear about what's going on in public schools, to hear about new ideas, to um, take on reports, um, evaluation reports, and discuss those. And every year they put out a report before the session starts saying, here are some ideas that the General Assembly should adopt. If you look at the chart on the bottom left there, you can see how the overall trend there has been for fewer and fewer education oversight. Uh, committee meetings, especially once the transition of power happened uh, after the 2010 election. And actually for the first time in 2016-17 interim between those two budget sessions, Ed Oversight didn't meet at all. And I think that's the first time that that's happened in history. Uh, apparently everything's going great and they, education doesn't need any oversight. Um, so the second avenue here publicly is the um, Joint Ed Appropriations meetings. And these meetings occur in session, Senate and House members, the guys that write the education budget. And this is really their opportunity to see how school funding works, uh, highlight major issues for the upcoming budget session, and to really take a line item look at the public school's budget. Um, you can also see a trend there of fewer and fewer meetings. Um, one thing you can't see in that chart is that 2017 was the first year that anyone around here can remember that the Ed Joint Ed Appropriations Committee did not take that line item review of the public schools budget. Um, and really, I looked through other committee meetings, the education subcommittee, there was the only one, House of Health and Human Services, Justice Public Safety, NER, all of these subcommittees looked at their uh, line item, line item by line item of how their budgets work. Um, they did not do that for public schools this last long session. 
Um, there are a few other factors that I want to touch upon. I didn't really touch upon these in the report because they're more based on personal observation rather than sort of data that I can point to. Um, but a few things I saw when I was on the staff that changed over the years um, that I would consider contributing to the poor governance practices. Uh, first is work ethic or lack of intellectual curiosity. Um, as, <laughs> as, a as a member of fiscal <laughs> So when I was on the fiscal research staff, one of the prime responsibilities is getting good nonpartisan information to the members of the General Assembly. And really there was a change in the work volume that occurred um, after the change in leadership. My job became much easier. I was asked to do a lot less. Um, second is paranoid conspiratorial thinking. Um, there's a tendency not to believe data. You know, you can look at the class size issue as a, um, prime example of this, and we've got members that say that, that um, they fully funded class size requirements even though the data clearly points otherwise. Um, you have the debates at the UNC system um, between the Board of Governors staff, who are comprised of many former members of the General Assembly, not trusting information from Margaret Spelling's staff, um, which is a bit crazy in my opinion. Um, and finally, the third one is the growth of the um, political staff at the General Assembly. Um, after 2010, uh, the corner offices hired a lot more political staff. A lot of times these are um, younger people with, who maybe lack um, experience or subject area expertise, but there has been an increasing trend from the corner offices to increasingly rely on their own political staff for crafting policy rather than um, looking towards the central nonpartisan staff. So let's go through the past few budgets and talk about sort of the examples of how things um, have unraveled in the state. Uh, first is the 2011 budget. Um, so when the Republicans took control of the General Assembly, that first year they really didn't have uh, much or any revenue to work with. So there weren't any real major new um, initiatives, but they did something that I think sort of sowed the seeds for the class size controversy we're seeing today um, and also sort of underscores their inability to understand how public schools budgets actually work. Um, so one of their main um, new expenditure was expanding funding for teachers by $60 million. But at the same time, they never mandated that school districts actually lower their K-3 class sizes, and they passed an additional $120, millions of, $120 million of discretionary budget cuts. Um, so of course, the additional 60 million did not actually lead to lower class sizes. Uh, the districts that had to identify a certain amount of budget cuts at the time, they just gave that money back to the General Assembly because now they had uh, additional budget cuts to fund. So there were several members that were very confused why their additional expenditures did not actually lead to lower class size at the time. 2012, um, sort of things started hitting the ground here. Uh, the Excellent Public Schools Act was really Senator Berger's primary uh, education policy initiative. Um, and for this, Senator looked to Florida, which will be a common theme throughout this presentation. And the Excellent Public Schools Act really had two pieces. The first was Read to Achieve, which ended social promotion for students who failed to pass uh, their third grade reading test. And the second was A through F school performance grades. So both of these were borrowed from Florida and both very flawed. Uh, the first one, uh, excellent public, I'm sorry, the um, read to achieve. The main problem here is the North Carolina tried to do it on the cheap. Uh, you know, they looked to Florida for the policy, but not for actually what they spent money on. Um, so Florida spent money on instructional coaches, professional development for teachers, new instructional materials and summer reading camps for students across all elementary grades. In North Carolina, the additional investment was only on diagnostic tests to identify uh, readers that were having difficulty, and a um, summer camp only for students who had already, pa already failed the third grade reading test. So there was no investment in any, in, any um, interventions that will actually help students pass that third grade reading test. <laughs> Um, and we, you know, we've seen actually, if you look at the um, grade three, end of grade reading tests, they have been on a downward trend ever since Read to Achieve was passed, uh, which is uh, not a good sign for the success of the program. 
Uh, the second part is the school performance grades. This is a chart that many of you have probably seen before documenting the way the school performance grades that were adopted, giving, you know, giving every school an A through F performance grade, is really correlated very strongly to the number of students from low-income families in those schools. And um, I can say that that is not a, mis a mistake. They, these school performance grades were explicitly designed to stigmatize schools from low perform with uh, a significant portion of students from low-income families. Um, and the issue here is what's um, the difference between growth versus achievement. The General Assembly basically had two options when they wanted to create these school performance grades. Uh, the first is to look only at student achievement. And student achievement is, okay, what was the average score that these students got on the test that day? Or in the actual case of um, school performance grades, the percentage of students who passed the, the um, third grade, or passed their state tests that day. Um, the other option is what's called growth, where you look at how... <coughs> how much the school actually contributed to the additional learning of that student throughout the year, which, of course, gives you a better idea of how much learning is actually going on at that school. Um, so, of course, achievement, very highly correlated with student income, and the formula that they went with for the school performance grades based 80% on achievement. So, of course, what you see here in the school performance grades, uh, they really end up uh, just stigmatizing the school's that have a lot of lower income students. Which brings me to of course, one of my favorite uh, articles from The Onion, which uh, talked about the pros and cons of standardized testing. And it, the, uh, con, the first con they identify, I think really talks to our school performance grade, that there are easier ways to measure parents' income. So we could, we could just scrap the school performance grades we have in place now, and just ask students, okay, how much, how much do your parents make? 2013, uh, moved on, again, looking to Florida. So we had the Opportunity Scholarship Voucher Program. You know, we had schools that were underfunded, and um, the idea here was then to provide vouchers to allow students to go to also underfunded, unaccountable private schools. <laughs> there are some few, uh, you know, few uh, issues with the Opportunity Scholarship Program, why it is a, a weak version of a voucher program. Uh, first was that the, fun the um, Funding structure and the lack of discriminatory protection for schools ended up causing the program to be held up in court for a few for a year or so. Of course, that's never ideal. You don't want to be wasting money on court cases, even though maybe maybe this general assembly does want to be wasting money on court cases. Uh, second here was lax eligibility requirements. One advantage you often hear from proponents about your programs is they're a way for the state to save money. Uh, you know, your voucher is less than you would spend on that student if they stayed in public schools. So when that student leaves public schools, goes to a private school, the state ends up spending money. Uh, unfortunately, with the Opportunity Scholarship Program, the eligibility requirements were written in such a way that many of the students receiving, um, many of the students receiving the voucher are students who would have gone to a private school anyway. So the state doesn't save money uh, when the voucher is given to these students. And the final reason is worst in the nation accountability which is really um, sort of, I think it's probably the most inexcusable of all, all three of these because it's a, it's a betrayal of conservative, free market philosophy on how school choice is supposed to work. You know, if you think about a functioning mark, a free market, it needs three things. It needs many buyers, so in case of vouchers, many students looking to go to private school or public school. You need many sellers, so in this case you need a lot of private schools for students to choose from. And the third thing, which is often ignored by uh, some free market advocates, is that you need good information to allow parents and students to make decisions on which school they, can, they want to attend. And you know, the school choice advocates continue to fight against those accountability measures. 2014, we moved on to virtual charter schools, and out of all the programs highlighted in the report, this is the one that I really found most inexcusable at the time. Uh, virtual charter schools had been in place in many states around the country. Uh, they had been a failure in every other state around the country, both in terms of student performance and uh, in many cases outright fraud. 
So the quote here, it's, a, it's literally as if the kid did not go to school for an entire year. And that was Stanford researcher Margaret Raymond uh, in her 2015 study uh, looking at math performance of students who had gone to virtual charter schools. It was as if they did not learn anything. Um, but even at the time, North Carolina authorized virtual charters. We knew a few things. We knew that virtual charters in Pennsylvania and Colorado had fraudulently overstated their enrollment to draw down more state dollars. Uh, and that schools in Tennessee and Florida had falsified records. A uh, school in Idaho had outsourced their grading to India. And uh, Georgia and Delaware, had their virtual charters had repeatedly been cited for failing the federal IDEA requirements for students with disabilities. Um, so how, you know, like I said, not only did we get virtual charters, we got an exceptionally bad version of virtual charters. Uh, the authorizing language for virtual charters was literally written by industry lobbyists, um, ignored a state board of education study on how best to create and operate virtual charter schools. Uh, it lacked safeguards, such as tying funding to student performance. Uh, instead, these virtual charters are paid just for maximizing enrollment which leads to some perverse incentives where they maybe spend more on marketing to students rather than actually providing high quality <coughs> education. Um, the legislation failed to provide DPI the resources to accurately <coughs> audit the enrollment in these schools, which is scary since we know some of these schools uh, have been fraudulently boosting their uh, enrollment to draw down on state funds. And like a lot of these programs, there's no uh, no independent evaluation. Um, the one thing I will say that when I was on fiscal staff, I delivered members a memo with up to 15 policy options for how to strengthen our virtual charter legislation. And to date, of course, none of those have been adopted. Um, instead, they actually moved the other way. The only change they've made in the legislation has been to loosen the requirements, allowing the virtual charter schools to have higher level of dropouts than uh, when originally written. Oh, and of course, since that time, we know that each of our two virtual charter schools have been in the bottom 1% for student growth their, their first two years of operation. So, not shockingly, they haven't worked. Uh, 2015 is when we go on to the class size chaos. Um, I won't spend too much time on this since uh, Senator Chaudhry really covered the issue. Um, but <laughs> The mandate was created as part of the 2015 budget. Uh, it said that school districts effective 27-18 school year would have to meet lower class sizes without additional funding. And that requirement was since, since kicked out to the 18-19 school year, um, causing school districts to meet that requirement, uh, reduce offerings in art, music, PE, increasing grade sizes in grades four through five, dropping their pre-K offerings, and holding class, converting uh, closets to classrooms. Of course, uh, this program has really generated an unprecedented level, I would say, of inaccuracy, uh, misinformation. Uh, Rob doesn't like it when I use the term lies, but I would say several of these, several of these have been lot, just out of out that lies. Um, you know, we've got our corner staff claiming that the next year's requirements are fully funded, which which really implies that myself, but more importantly, 115 uh, school boards, 115 school finance officers, 115 school superintendents across the state have all entered into some strange conspiracy to pretend that this is an actual problem uh, up when really the math shows that we're not pretending at all, this is a real problem across the state. Of course, there's an easy fix to the class size controversy. The Senator, you know, Senator Chaudhry has introduced the bill that will align class size requirements with the actual funding levels, preserve funding for the enhancement teachers, and I, the best part about it all is it costs the state nothing. So I'm not sure why the General Assembly has been unwilling to move forward with uh, that plan. 2016, we move on to the Innovation School District, originally known as um, the ASD. For this one, we uh, turned our attention away from Florida and looked at Tennessee where they had an ASD in, um, that had been around for a few years and had not been working. Um, under an ASD, probably should explain what that is, they take low performing schools and instead of addressing the actual issues of the underlying challenges of low performing schools, 
They say, we will turn you into, we will let you be run by a charter operator, um, which I think most people would describe as sort of rearranging the chairs on the Titanic. Um, so, but in, before North Carolina adopted its ASD program, uh, George Washington University study actually looked at why Tennessee's program had failed and identified three challenges, high student mobility, uh, the challenge of serving special needs students, and lack of community buy-in. So North Carolina knew about these challenges. Uh, you would think they would say, okay, well, we want our program to succeed, so let's think about ways to address these challenges. Um, but that did not happen. There was nothing in North Carolina's policy that addressed the challenges that derailed Tennessee's program. Nor did North Carolina invest the $50 million that Tennessee invested in its ASD schools. Um, and of course, school selection this year was met by, met by um, an incredible level of community pushback, especially in Durham, and they were only able to select one school into the program. And basically only able to select that program because the school's only other option was to shut down. Uh, so it was really sort of a coercive process rather than a community-based process. Finally, in 2017, we got the personal education savings accounts. Uh, these a lot of people describe as vouchers on steroids. Um, under a personal education savings account, parents of students with disabilities are eligible to receive a $9,000 debit card that they can be used on a wide range of products and services. Um, it's important to note, though, that we already have a voucher program for students with disabilities to be able to leave the public schools and go to a private school. Um, called the Disabilities Grant Voucher, and that program uh, was undersubscribed last year. So it was unclear exactly what, what problem was hoped to be solved by having a second voucher program on top of the existing voucher program, especially when this voucher program has higher administrative costs. And it shares a lot of, of course, it shares a lot of these sort of negative, um, negative outcomes of voucher programs. You know, it, there's no, first of all, there's no evidence that they work. Uh, these voucher programs do pull money from public schools because um, they, they don't take into account the fixed costs public schools have when they lose students. And it, most importantly, in my mind at least, uh, these voucher programs undermine the notion of public schools as a shared responsibility for all citizens of the state. Um, but again, you know, we didn't just get a new voucher program, we got one of the worst versions of a voucher program. Uh, now the one benefit of education savings accounts in other states is that they allow parents to take un unused money at the end of the year and at the end of that student's um, high school career, that money can then be applied towards the student's college education. Uh, for some reason, our members of the General Assembly decided to not allow that feature as part of our education savings account uh, program. Uh, our education savings accounts also allow parents to double and triple dip into the existing voucher program. So if a student is eligible for the other two voucher programs, they could potentially receive uh, over $21,000. Uh, second, uh, sorry, next, the education savings accounts open up brand new avenues for fraud. So a lot of the accountability for how that money is spent, and it can be spent on a wide, wide array of services and goods, um, it mostly require, it mostly relies on self-reporting from the parents. Um, so that is going to make it difficult to avoid some of the, the fraudulent purchases we've seen in states like Arizona. Um, you know, for example, I could start Nordstrom Tutoring Services. Uh, you could pay me $5,000 and I could give you $2,000 back in cash and we could just call it a day. And of course, as with all our other voucher uh, programs and many of the other programs I've noted today, the personal education savings accounts also lack accountability and there's no third party evaluation to let us know whether these are actually adequately serving the students that take the savings accounts. So after all these years, seven years of what I would consider pretty bad education policy, uh, we are seeing a negative impact on students, which is really the most important thing we want to look at. And it's, Look at it from the input and the output side. Uh, first, from the input side, you see that per student funding, state funding, is still down from pre-recession levels. It's about 7% below the 08-09 levels when you 
uh, look at it on a per student basis and adjust for inflation. Uh, this is consistent with some emerging research from Bruce Baker at Rutgers University where he found that as states expand their school choice offerings, their effort at funding uh, public education tends to go down. And so it looks like we're seeing the same thing in North Carolina, where you know, our effort, which is a measure of how much we spend on public schools in relation to the size of our economy, you know, North Carolina ranks incredibly low on those measures, often in the bottom 10 of the country. Uh, to the extent that we've seen increases in per student spending or funding over the last few years, it's really been constrained to teacher salaries and the increased costs of um, employee benefits. When you actually sort of dig under the hood and look at the actual allotments that are provided to school districts, you see of the biggest $18 allotments, 14 of them uh, have been reduced on a per student basis since Republicans took control of the General Assembly. And even one of those textbooks um, you see there was a big increase because it was basically zeroed out during the depths of the recession. Um, it still remains about half of an adequate level of funding or where it used to be before the recession. Also with position allotments, uh, North Carolina schools have, on a per student basis, have fewer classroom teachers, fewer instructional support personnel, so that's your librarians, your nurses, um, and fewer school building administrators, principals and assistant principals are provided to schools. So I look at the outcomes. Um, and first, let me just add, issue a little disclaimer, which is that we can't definitively tie any of the policies I highlight in the report to these negative student outcomes. Um, part of that is by design, as I've mentioned on a lot of these policies, there has been no third party evaluation or they've been designed in a way that you can't even have a third party evaluation if you wanted one. Um, so with that said, what we have seen are um, really a plateauing of North Carolina's test scores on the NAEP exam. And the NAEP is a national test that allows you to um, sort of look at how students are, compare student performance across states. And when you dig into those results, not only we've, we've seen a flattening for the state overall, but when you dig into the numbers, what you also see are exceptionally troubling, troubling trends for black students and students from low-income families. And this shouldn't be terribly shocking because if you think about the, pop, the major education initiatives that I've highlighted in this report, really none of them get to the issues faced by these students. They don't address the poverty-related barriers that prevent students from uh, reaching their potential. So for black students, um, NAEP scores fell in eighth grade math and reading and were flat in fourth grade math. Uh, between 2011 and 2015, which is the last results we have for NAEP, um, the achie black-white achievement gap increased in grade four math, grade eight reading, um, stayed flat in grade eight, um, grade eight math. North Carolina is just one of 11 states in the country that failed to reduce the black-white achievement gap um, across any of those three tests. Similar story when we move on to students from low-income families. Uh, the NAEP scores for free and reduced lunch eligible students fell in fourth grade math, eighth grade math, eighth grade reading. The income-based achievement gaps all grew across all those three um, tests, and North Carolina was just one of 13 states unable to improve the achievement gaps in any one of those tests. And of course, it's important to remember that students of color and students from low-income families are not a marginal portion of North Carolina's public school um, system. They're the majority of students that we have in the state. So when we're failing these students, we really are failing the entire state. So where do we go from here? Um, I think the first step is to break uh, North Carolina's addiction to tax cuts that mostly benefit uh, well-off people and corporations. Uh, so far, tax cuts cost us, if we look at the system that was in place back in 2013. We're short about 3.5 billion per year in revenue that we otherwise would have had if we left that tax system in place. And with tax cuts going into effect this next year, that number's gonna increase by a further 900 million. So we're gonna be $4.4 .4 billion short of where we otherwise would have been under our old tax regime. So we can afford to do more. And ideally we would use that money to invest in our public schools. 
Um, you know, currently, the General Assembly has a task force on school funding. Uh, Senator Tillman, Senator Lee are both parts of that task force. And they're looking to radically overhaul the way we fund our public schools, which there are, you know, we, we could improve the way we fund our public schools. But one of the main weaknesses of the way we currently fund our public schools is that we don't give enough money to our public schools. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, uh, Senator Tillman, Senator Lee, and the other members of the task force have committed themselves to explicitly not looking at the question of, are we adequately funding our public schools? <coughs> which is a shame. Third, uh, really a, a change in philosophy of, that we need to actually address, focusing on the whole child, so things like safety, social, physical, emotional health. These are all things that we need to start addressing, um, remove those poverty-related barriers that I talked about earlier. Uh, I think there's been a tendency these last seven years to pretend that school choice is really an, a substitute for delivering these services. Finally, we need to take a look at our governance practices. Um, there are a whole host of small things the General Assembly could be doing uh, to start being smarter about the way we make policy in the state. Um, Evidence-based policy, you know, considering the evidence, listening to educators, working hard to actually understand how things work. All of these things, I think, would lead to a lot better outcomes for our students. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions for you.